Welcome to Inflection Point Podcast, where we cultivate change from the inside out as we ponder the Cairo question. Will Cairo have to protest in his lifetime for the birthright to freely and peacefully exist in the skin in which he was born? We stand on the belief that dismantling racism goes beyond laws and legislation or politics and economics. Here, anti-racism activation is presented as an inside job where personal transformation and accountability impact social change. So take a seat at the Anti-Racism Activation Table with Inflection Point Podcast. Well, hello, and thank you for joining us for the newest episode of Inflection Point Podcast. At Inflection Point Podcast, we are dedicated to the art of listening in authentic conversation. We challenge our audience to listen actively and intentionally for the purpose of awareness, understanding, and ultimately transformation. I am your host, Anita Russell, and here's a quick hello from co-hosts, Mavis and Gail. Hi, everybody. I'm Mavis Bauman. Hi, I'm Gail Hunter, and welcome. Thank you, ladies. Um, So for today, the theme that we will focus on is embrace equity. And I'm gonna start off with a quote from Isabel uh, Wilkerson because I love the way she frames up her conversation around um, the hierarchy that we live under, the systems that we live under, like a house that we all live in, right? So here's the quote. We are all in this house. And that means that all of us suffer if we don't fix this house. I I mean, we all suffer the lack of generosity and magnanimity toward our fellow citizens because a caste system, a hierarchy such as ours actually pits people against one another and makes people believe that they have no stake in the well-being of their fellow citizens. So we are at odds. We don't see how this hurts, actually hurts every single person one of us. And so I kind of align that with this year's International Women's Day. Um, If you recall, International Women's Day is officially on March the 8th. And this year they put out a global call for us to embrace equity. The International Women's Day is a celebration of social, economic, cultural, and political achievements of women and has been observed since the early 1900s. It's a collective movement that is felt and activated around the world. And embracing equity isn't about what we just say or what we write about or what we think about. Equity is not something that we should be debating. It is something that we all need to think about, to learn about, to value, and to embrace because we all live in this house together. And equity should be a part of our individual, our collective belief systems, conversations, and our actions. It means creating, it means creating a truly inclusive world. So just sit back and let that sink in what the world would look like if we truly operated under a belief system of equity. So the question is, what are you, you meaning you as an individual, willing to do to embrace equity and contribute to reimagining a different future and a different world. So let's think about this this word equity. And you might be thinking in your mind, like, well, what's the difference between equity and equality? And the reason I wanted to call that out are very obvious. So the International Women's Day organization drives home three major points. Equity isn't just a nice to have. It's a need to have as we push towards global transformation. And a focus on gender equity specifically needs to be a part of every uh, the society, the DNA of every uh, section of our society, right? 
And it's critical to understand the difference between equity and equality. And that last point is particularly relevant because when you think about it, sometimes those terms are used in a ch interchangeably or they're used synonymously. So the lines between the two can get blurred very, very easily. So let's just break it down a little bit. In its essence, equality is about sameness, where everybody gets the same of something, regardless of needs or circumstances or lived experience. On the other hand, equity is acknowledging where people are and their unique circumstances, their needs, and then leveling the playing field accordingly. Because if we're going to have this inclusive world, we all need to have access to a level playing field. So people start from different places and different life experiences. So when you think about it in terms of diversity and inclusion, you can see that these two terms, diversity and inclusion, require equity as a catalyst. So equity takes us beyond the, the parameter of um, it, um, equality and it puts us in a different um, domain, if you will. And the truth of the matter is we really can all embrace equity, but it takes individual effort on our part in order to be able to, to do that. And so we can actively support and embrace equity within our own unique spheres of influence. That's in our homes, our specific workplaces, um, our specific communities, our specific educational institutions, in our everyday lives. We can make the choice as individuals to avoid stereotypes, to call out discrimination and bias, and actively seek diversity, inclusion in wherever spaces we find ourselves. And each of us can heed the call for individual change that fuels that grassroots action to usher in global momentum in the name of embracing equity. So the question is, again, what are you going to do? What are you doing? Perhaps you're already doing some stuff, some work in the space of equity, or what is it that you're planning to do to embrace equity? So Mavis and Gal, I wanna hear from you in terms of how you think about on a personal level, how you think about that term of embracing equity. I'll, I'll confess that I just learned the difference between <laughs> equity and equality last week. And they're so radically different. They sound so similar. And I've even seen some writers say they're basically the same definition, but they are not. And Anita, do you care if I talk about the Apple example? <laughs> oh, no, not exam not, not yeah, at all. That not just all. made it so, so yes, clear for yes. me. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Anita shared this example she found of uh, snack time in a little kindergarten, I guess. And uh, there were like five kids and the teacher had five apples, one for each child. And one of the children was allergic to apples. And so equality would have been everybody gets an apple no matter what. Equity was he couldn't eat an apple. It would have made him sick. So how about another piece of fruit? This is not taking anything away from anybody. And it's giving the kids something to survive on for the afternoon. Little kids don't do well when their sugar levels drop. And I just think that that's so clear. It didn't cost anybody anything to just give him something different. And that just uh, really drove home the difference to me. I was also just thinking about um, my house is an old uh, a very old house with low um, door door frames. And I had a friend visiting this summer who was like 6'5". And I'm thinking, this house would not give him equity because he cannot go through the doors 
without stooping. So to make the place equitable, we would have to raise the door jams. It doesn't cost me anything. It doesn't change my life at all. But then the house is equally accessible and everyone has then the same sort of experience there. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of, you know, searching for examples to further uh, have that sink into my mind. Because when I look back at my corporate experience, I think we were always talking about equality. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, same numbers for everybody, same proportion of this, same proportion of that it was more about math. Now, this goes into more about fairness, compassion, and so on. So that's my bit. How, how about you, Gail? Wait, before well, Gail uh, steps oh, yeah. in, I want to say in that example, the Apple example, one of the reasons why that's such a good example also is because it's the caregiver in that situation right. who makes the distinction as to whether whether or not this is going to be a system of equality or a system of equity based on whatever decision she decides to make, he or she decides to make. And so if the caregiver makes the decision that says, oh, I'm sorry, Johnny, but it's Apple Day, so you're just going to have to go without. So why don't you just go over there and play while the other children are having their Apple? Or a different choice can be made. OK, fine. Let's see what else we have that would not be harmful to you. So it's that person, that caregiver is the one that is making that choice, whether or whether or not to stay in that, that space of equality or to move into something more beneficial like equity. So Gail? Thank you. That was an important piece of the yeah, story. Really important. <laughs> but, right, because a caregiver can be at any level of our existence, right? Whether it's actually a parent or a teacher or all the way up to the government. Um, that how much is it really hurting or taking away from anybody by creating equity, right? It doesn't, it just is a shift, bit, bit of a shift, but it's not a really inconvenient. It's not really, you know, taking away from anyone, I think, uh, from what I, what I could see. And so equity is really important. Um, and to look at it from a different mindset, you know, to shift that, you know, um, and to, yes. to give that allergic child the same level of energy and concentration and care as the others. Because mm -hmm. it's really about That's the cool. access to that care and the access to that, whatever the specific is, that creates the equity. Um, and everyone right. could have that access to whatever that specific care would be or mm -hmm. issue would be. Yeah, definitely. Because if the choice by the caregiver is made Oh, Johnny, well, you, you, we'll find something for you tomorrow. We'll have something different tomorrow. Um, so in the meantime, today, how is Johnny going to fare for the rest of the afternoon or, you know, whenever that next break might be when they're like maybe getting lunch or something uh, in terms of his energy level, and what's going to be happening to his body potentially because he didn't get what he needed, that nourishment that he needed in that particular uh, moment. Well, his body and his self-esteem and his feeling of feeling left out, right? And, and different, oh, yeah. separate from, you know? Yeah, good point. Yeah. Good point. And now we can take it many different levels too and look at it. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And we can look at that caregiver and see ourselves as, as Gail was just mentioning, we can see ourselves in that caregiver. What choice right. would you make? If you make the equitable choice and you have sort of this more equitable mindset, it applies across the board in our society, not just in a preschool uh, classroom dealing with children. Right. 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 So I think at this point, we're going to slide the mic over to uh, Mavis and she's going to talk to <laughs> us and take a little bit deeper and she's going to connect mindset to this conversation and looking at it from the standpoint of critical self-reflection. Yes, yes. I'm going to be quoting a lot from an article by Ash Buchanan, and it's called The Nature of Mindsets. In that article, he says, mindsets provide us with fragmented ways of looking at the world, never with complete facts of what is. I'm just going to read that again since it's short. Mindsets provide us with fragmented ways 
of looking at the world never with complete facts of what is. Um, we're going to, I want to talk about this mindset in the context of racism, of course, and white supremacy. And, um, you know, a little history is the word mindset was first used in the 1930s. That's not that long ago <laughs> to mean habits of the mind formed by previous experience. Um, in simple terms, mindsets are deeply held beliefs, attitudes, and assumptions we create about who we are and how the world works. You know, as I was reading through this article, I kept saying, I'm doing that. I'm doing that. I know I'm doing that. I mean, I, it's probably somewhat of a natural response to intellectually managing your, your place in the world, but it's faulted. Um, any attempt to shift our, shift our minds, Buchanan says, mindset, shifts our, shift our mindsets will be met by powerful forces. An example of these forces is our tendency for confirmation bias. Uh, the searching for information that reconfirms our existing beliefs. So that really cements our, our mindsets. Um, so if we think of an example, uh, if you are white, what is your mindset about black people? Uh, how did you form that mindset? Uh, how does that affect your thoughts, behaviors, and actions toward bl black people? Um, I was just listening to a podcast today called Hidden Brain, and the episode was on implicit bias. And uh, the guests mentioned that often we become of the place where we live. And so we're thinking about how culturally we are fed certain beliefs, um, uh, behaviors in order to kind of conform in our the area we live in. And then we be, that becomes a mindset as we move forward. I, I can tell you uh, a dozen from growing up in Nebraska for sure. But the question we need to ask is, do we want to keep those mindsets? And would you want to keep those mindsets if you knew that they were hurting others? What if you knew that they were hurting even you? So we make our mindsets. And then Buchanan says, our mindsets make us. Um, our, our thoughts, words, and actions radiate out from our mindsets like ripples on the surface of a lake. I mean, you know, this is this is really humbling again to think about what you believe and how it's emanating from you in ways that you don't even know. Um, he goes on to say that mindsets are a powerful leverage point for cultural and systemic change. And this is exciting too. He says, um, if we want to more consciously create the world we live in, we must be opening open to shifting our mindsets. And he talks about how the, the way to change the world is the collective individual mindset change. And I, I think that that's pretty exciting because we look at things like racism and they're, they're just so, uh, uh, these kinds of concepts, uh, systems are hurting our world, and we think that we cannot do anything about them, but we can. Um, he also says, um, the more developed our mindsets become, that means away from fixed mindsets, the more we unfold toward deeper levels of wisdom and effectiveness. And I love that. Um, our ability to take a perspective improves, as does our capacity to embrace ambiguity and hold paradox. Um, I, I wanna mention uh, Jeffrey Robinson's film called Who We Are. Um, he talks about this very thing. Uh, early on in his film, he says, America is the greatest country in the world and it is the most racist country in the world. And he said, both things are true and they are not mutually exclusive. And, you know, sometimes when you hear the conversations on the, you know, the media waves, it's like, they can't both be true. And as we develop, loosen up our mindsets a little bit, we become more uh, comfortable with the idea of a, 
a, of a paradox like that. Um, so in terms of addressing um, mindsets, um, he Buchanan suggests using the power of mindfulness so that we can transcend our blind spots. Um, I mentioned early on in our podcast, at least a year ago, how I was walking alone in uh, uh, Newark, New Jersey, in an area that was not populated. I, I was alone. There weren't any cars really going by. And there was, uh, you know, five good sized young black men coming towards me. And uh, like I say, my heart started to race. And and then I became angry that I was having this fear response to these black men coming toward me. And I realized, well, first of all, back then, I, I just thought, no, you are not going to have this attitude. And so I spoke to them and they were lovely. And it and it and that experience alone increased my mindfulness about my own body language, my eye contact, my, you know, I'm, I'm not going to grab my purse. I'm going to look these guys right in the eyes. And it was just such a positive thing. So once you start becoming mindful, um, you know, you're, you start to reinforce the, the breaking down of the mindsets. Um, let's see, one of the other great quotes I wanted to give you. Um, all of today's mindsets, Buchanan says, create global prog problems, and they are consequences of reliving unexamined habits of the mind. Um, one of these mindsets that we really want to get at is the idea of uh, win-lose or zero-sum. Um, this mindset says, if someone wins something, someone else has to lose something. This is, this is connected to this scarcity mindset. I can't not win uh, because that if in order for you to have something, in order for you to have the apple you need, then I might lose mine. Um, so this scarcity mindset says there's just not enough on the planet. And so greed starts to step in. I need mine and I need mine first. Um, so he writes, what if we reorganized our thoughts and our social, economic, and political systems toward a mindset of abundance? Now, Gail's going to talk more about this here in a little bit. But the point I want to make is if we think, behave, and decide win-win principles, we might actually all gain something. Less poverty, cleaner environments, less inequity, less racism overall. So um, another writer, uh, Sumanta Nayak writes, uh, a win-win so situation is a mutually beneficial outcome where all parties involved feel satisfied and fulfilled. I mean, picture a world like that. I mean, eh, it would just be beautiful. And we can start, you know, working this way. Um, he, he even cites uh, Stephen Covey, you know, the seven habits of effective people, highly effective people that says, uh, in the long term, win-win situations are the most effective way to build trust, respect, and cooperation in relationships. And um, I vote yes on that. So I, I think we just all need to sit with ourselves, become more mindful about our mindsets, and think about what do we, who do we want to be in the world? And what kind of world do we want to create? Um, I, I know that I, even in doing this study, I've just got, discovered many mindsets I wanna break. And um, I'm excited about this whole concept of identifying them and loosening them up. So any questions, ladies? Anything else you mm -hmm. wanna add? Yeah, I don't, I have something that I want to add, and I've shared okay. this story. I've shared this story with you, uh, with you all before, um, and this is my example of critical self reflection as it relates to whether whether or not I'm being equitable towards a group mm -hmm. of people, right? And maybe as you know this story, when we went, um, when we were preparing to go to South Africa. <clears throat> 
one of the things that I specifically did was acknowledge the fact that I grew up in America, which is a racialized society. And my biggest almost fear and concern was that I was going to take any hint of that with me into South Africa. This was the first time I was ever on the African continent. And I was just so uh, conscious and aware of examining myself and me being, <clears throat> excuse me, me being a woman of faith. My prayer literally for about 30 days before we left was around the idea that I did not want to take any bias with me. I looked at it from the standpoint, you are completely leaving your society and going into somebody else's society. That includes their language, their culture, their food, their homes, their way of living, everything about them, I got removed from my, from my surroundings and put directly into something different. And so the thing for me is, um, or was at that time, I don't wanna bring anything with me that's going to come across as a bias. And so that was my critic, that was a very critical self-reflective turning point for me because once I got to South Africa, I was able to receive everything right. that that trip was about in, 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 in terms of the benefit that I got out of being there and having that experience was it was just greatly beneficial and it just helped me to be a much better person. So I just wanted to kind of share that. We still have about two more minutes before we um, go to break. So Gail, did you want to share your thoughts? Well, I mean, it's so crucial to change that mindset, right? To, to be open to really looking in the mirror within ourselves and to understanding that um, we all we all have imprints that have happened to us growing up and, and over generations. And we can't change or control that, but we can change what we are doing with that in the present time. And so, you know, I've, I've there was a time you talked about the story about, um, I think maybe you've talked about it. When I was on probably my late twenties or thirties, I was driving, this was before cell phones and GPS and everything else. Right. So I was going to a conference in Philadelphia and I was driving and I got lost in the, in the, probably one of the, not so safe neighborhoods in Philadelphia, right? And so I kept driving around the same place, same area, and I had no idea how to get out of there or where to go. And I kept passing this one man, he was a black man that was walking down the street. And I thought, and I could hear in my head all the generational belief systems that were, I didn't really believe, but they were there. And then I thought, you know what? This is ridiculous. I'm lost and he might be able to help me. So I stopped, pulled over asked him the question he did he gave me the directions and where I was going and it was wonderful and I was so grateful because it's like midnight too it's like 12 o'clock on a Friday night and so I it was not maybe the safest but that was okay I I was really grateful that I was able to do that and to, and to shift from those mindsets that I could keep hearing right mm -hmm. from all the generations before me and ground <laughs> myself in what really is true and we how, remember those yeah. experiences don't we Gail yeah when we head on say ah mm -hmm. I'm doing it too. Right. <laughs> and I don't have to we, do that. We, I can choose yeah, We are going to take a break now <clears throat> and just a short break, and then we'll come back and jump right back into the conversation. So welcome back. You are listening to Inflection Point Podcast on Transformation Talk Radio. And our topic for today is embrace equity. And we're going to pass the mic once again over to uh, Gail, and she's going to talk even deeper about this whole mindset things and maybe talk specifically about different types of mindset, but we're still framing our conversation around critical self-reflection. Thank you. Um, so the quote that I chose is from Mah Mah Mahatma Gandhi, and it's funny, I didn't I don't think I'd ever connected the, the dots here, but I always will tell people something similar to this quote. And his quote is, your beliefs become your thoughts, your thoughts become your words, your words become your actions, and your actions become your habits. Your habits become your values, 
and your values become your destiny. That's a very powerful quote, right? Mm -hmm. And if you really let it sink in, our beliefs create our, this is what I tell people, our beliefs create our thoughts, our feelings, and our behavior. And we can't change that behavior or that thought or that feeling without changing that very belief that created it. We have to change that mindset and change that belief. And so mindsets are created a lot by experiences um, from various things that we have, that we experience in our life and imprints that happen to us. Um, and from any new experiences, even we can then shift and create new mindsets. There are often blind spots in our mindsets, right? Things that we're just not aware of. They're fragmented ways that we have gotten pieces and, and information. It's kind of like when I, the, what I described before, when I was lost in Philadelphia, I was having some other mindsets from generations coming into my mind that I was lost and, and I had to clear that in order to say, wait, I'm lost and this person could help me. And so um, it's, it's being willing to really look within yourself and listen to where this is coming from. And is it really absolutely true? Or is it something that had been true for somebody else or they believed it was true? It doesn't mean it's true for me. Um, a growth mindset is symbolized by the everyday learner. And a benefit mindset is symbolized by the everyday leader. And so the growth mindset is people understand that their talents and abilities can be developed through effort and persistence. They don't really think everyone is the same or anyone can be an Einstein, but they do believe that everyone can get smarter if they really work at it. They can learn and they can develop. A benefit mindset um, is when we seek to fulfill our own potential, but we choose to do it in a way that contributes to the well being of others and society as a whole. We question why we do what we do and believe in doing good things for good reasons. That's not just gonna benefit me, but it's gonna benefit everyone and potentially even up to everyone collectively in, in humanity. So on a personal level, examining mindsets can create subtle, yet sometimes very radical bookmarks in our mind. When suddenly new ways of seeing something or being and ultimately acting become really available to us and free to us, these kind of liberating shifts can go on to meaningfully transform our lives in surprising and fulfilling ways. For some of you, this may be enough of a reason to inquire into the nature of your mindset, or there's a deeper reason to examine your habits of your mind. The ultimate source of today's greatest challenge, really the primary root cause that creates all of our crises in the first place, is actually all of our mindsets. All of today's great global problems are consequences of reliving unexamined habits of the mind. And really think about that. Think about the crises that are going on today in the United States and all and globally. It's all based on not being aware, not looking and examining and looking at the consequences of what it is causing to keep reliving these unexamined habits that we call mindsets that we've attached to. So the deeper reason to examine our mindsets is so we can mount and develop a self-aware awareness response to the great challenges of each day. We simply can't respond to our personal and global problems in a meaningful way unless we really learn how to examine those mindsets and, and look at it as an integral part of how we live in our lives each day. When I look at anti-racism as a growth mindset, um, which is symbolized by the everyday learner, it's like if I wanted to shift that and grow, I would begin to read about the accurate amounts, accounts of the history of racism in this country and globally. I might be more aware and I would benefit by maybe being more conscious of noticing, being mindful of what I believe and feel about racism from what I've learned and what I currently believe. And that could, would be an example of growth mindset. It's more personal, it's more of what I wanna believe, what I wanna to choose to learn from. A benefit mindset builds on a growth mindset. And when we understand that our abilities can be developed and we also understand that we can transform towards a more caring and inclusive and interdependent perspective. It's called the benefit mindset because it is concerned with the lifelong process of learning, how we can be the transformation and realize our unique potential in a way that serves the well-being of everyone. And so it really is a benefit mindset that does symbolize by the everyday leader that we each have the potential and possibility of being. In a benefit mindset, we seek to fulfill our potential, but we also, as I said before, choose to do it in a way that really contributes to the well-being of others and society as a whole. 
We question why we do what we do and believe in good things for good reasons, valid reasons. So if I look at anti-racism in a benefit mindset, I would be more interested in sharing what I was learning with another, making eye contact when I speak to someone, um, especially people uh, that are black or Asian um, or people of color, that oftentimes we don't make eye contact. And I would be much more conscious about actually acting on that and being very aware of that. And, tr and as I would with everybody, um, I might be more willing to volunteer or take action, maybe through individual conversations with others around a new awareness and beliefs around racism and open to sharing and helping others maybe be able to grow within themselves from a fixed mindset to possibly either a growth or benefit mindset. But the act of the action, I'd be doing something. I also could write an article or I could join a social political movement. I could maybe even start a, a podcast or be part of a podcast to help others locally, nationally, and globally go into a new mindset and be active in changing towards anti-racism. And so this is a simple example of how mindset we adopt shapes our everyday actions and the future possibilities of the world. How can we become more conscious of the mindsets we are living? Well, there's a wide range of practices for making more conscious choice. Um, one of them, um, I believe made as you mentioned, was mindfulness. And mindfulness is the observation without judgment, and that's, key, that's huge. Observation without judgment of self or other. Being curious is fine, but inquiring about what that might be about, but there's no judgment. And then looking and really asking yourself the question, is this true? And is it really absolutely true what I'm attaching to here? And if you hear a tiny little no inside, you want to go with that no and challenge it, right? And really listen to what that no is trying to tell you. So on a personal level, practice of mindfulness can help us become more aware of how our own mindsets are manifesting in our lives and our world, which they do every day. So we want to get in touch with, my, with the awareness that I'm not being aware of. I want to look to understand more um, and maybe take a step into doing something different. Um, so it's looking at, the benefit mindset looks at not just me, but it looks at me and we, and allows me to be part of that collective, right? Um, Martin Luther King, I love this quote, stated, it really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. We're all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. We are made to live together because of the interrelated structure of reality. Mm. Right? And that's very true. And something we all have to be able to remember and be mindful of. Right? In, a mind, in a benefit mindset, we understand we are not separate individuals going it alone. We are interdependent beings who belong to a massive global ecosystem. And every one of us has a role to play in creating healthy conditions on this planet that our interests, passions, our expertise. We believe we can grow. We take responsibility for transforming how we come to understand our place in the world and realize our potential in a way that affirms life and really supports others with doing the same. And that can create a ripple effect. It can create an incredible, profound awakening. You know? And it really becomes a purpose-driven mindset that also can shift into an equity mindset, which is what we talked about in the beginning, right? Because equity is about access and access to the same quality of healthcare, the same quality of education, the same help from police and the same respect from police. And it's about really giving all groups the same opportunities to succeed. Um, and I think that we all together can, once we begin to take a step into a different mindset, which at whatever level we are, it's going to contribute to that collective whole. And I noticed the time, so I think I'm almost out of time. So I wanted to kind of open up for just to see what all, what you both think about this. Mavis? I might be doing a little mindfulness, but not without judgment. Oh, that's <laughs> crucial. I, I, I said earlier, I made me so angry of what I thought about the guys that I encountered. And um, so, yeah, I got to work on the judgment part. Mm -hmm. but you know anything <laughs> whatever that's about with you or anyone else it's really about letting go of judgment mm -hmm. and wow. just being open to understand wow. mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yes, that's, that's big. judgment towards yourself as well as judgment right. another person. Exactly. Self. Oh, I thought it. I thought it was. It's both ways. <laughs> it's both, both ways. ways. Absolutely. Right. Ew. Absolutely. Okay. So if I find myself with somebody, I'm feeling irritable with them. Okay, that there's a judgment going on there, and I have to be mindful and aware of what is that judgment, so I can release it of myself and of the other. And then, what am I noticing? What am I feeling? What am I realizing? Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. So mm-hmm. one, the one thing that really jumped out is I loved when you used the phrase bookmarks in our mind. Yes. And it just made me think of when we had our conversation earlier today and how Mavis and I were talking about when we read books, we mm-hmm. mark in the book, right, right. highlight, yeah. turn down pages and stuff. Yeah. So we're literally marking spots in that book yes. for the purpose if we want to go back and refer to right. that. Right. And so having those bookmarks in your mind that come from your life experiences, Mm -hmm. what are those things that you've been taught to believe and all of that? It's a very similar. So I just really, really like the way you frame that up. And then as you were talking, I was thinking about what I my South Africa story. And what I realized is that what I was praying for, that whole entire thing, Mm -hmm is that I wanted to be a benefit to those I was going to encounter in South Africa. That's one side of it. But the other side of it was that I needed to make sure that I was being open to the benefit that they were going to provide for me. And if you've heard um, me talk about that trip, that is one of the hallmarks of my life was when we went to South Africa. And then finally, when you brought in the word leadership, I was, oh my God, that's so amazing because I live by the creed that leadership is influence. Mm -hmm. It is. Mm -hmm. And we all have the capacity to be a leader in some way, right? We all do. It's all, it's within us. We just have to access that truth and and shift our mindsets. And then- It does come out as- influence doesn't it in little ways hmm. interesting it really does it really does if you um if you follow john Max, john maxwell he's like the guru when it comes to uh influence and he's been, i'm sorry when it comes to leadership and so he's been developing his own way of looking at leadership for generations what maybe he's not that old for decades right. <laughs> For decades, he's been developing his notion of uh, of leadership and where he is right now after all of those decades and working with leaders ac- around the world and everything. That's what it all boiled down to for him is leadership is influence. And so that means if you have no, fl- no followers, you're not really a leader because the whole essence of leadership mm-hmm is that influence that you are having around the other, around other people. And it's a beneficial influence. It's intended to be a benefit to other people, not a hurt or not a hindrance to them. Um, So then you may not be, you're, you're not being effective as an influential leader if you're bringing harm to other people. Right. And so that's his whole entire way of kind of framing it up. And he talks a lot about this leader shift like shifting from, like we talk about these mindset shift, there's a leadership uh, shift as well. Um, so yeah, I just love how all of this stuff is coming together and how it all connects under the heading of embrace equity. So for our last, uh, our final thoughts here, um, what I had written down was embrace, I'm sorry, yes, yes. Embracing equity starts with me but it also starts with you and it must be forged by us. Yes. So just like Isabel Warpison talks about us all living in this house together, it also means we all have a responsibility to the house, right? We all have a responsibility to taking care of it, to keeping it clean, to its upkeep, to making sure that all of the systems are working the way that they're supposed to work so that everybody in the house is benefiting. Mm -hmm. So what are your final thoughts here? I just 
was really struck by your words early. Um, I guess it was quoting Isabel Wilkinson in Cast, right? The book Cast, yes. talking about the lack of generosity and mag magnanimity <laughs> towards our oh, fellow that word also <laughs> <laughs> toward our fellow citizens. I mean, that's what's happening. That's the essence of this mindset of win lose. I need mine. And, you know, to, to, to move toward the benefit mindset that Gail just described, but that lack of generosity just stings a little bit, you know, come on people, <laughs> we can do, we can do this. Yeah. I really was hit struck by that. Yeah. And to, you know, when an institution is founded on racism, it breeds a racist worldview, right? And so we can't change that without changing that which it was founded on. We mm -hmm. have to change that mindset, right? Mm -hmm. And we all have the ability to step into that place of inquiring within and sharing and listening and, um, and doing a lot of what we've been talking about. You know, and so we can create a road to get to that place of equity. Right. right. And the, the thing of it also is along those lines is that you can lock arms with me on one side and then you could lock arms with somebody else on the other side. Right. And as, as this chain starts to come together with these people locking arms, locking arms, right. locking arms, that's where that momentum comes in, that global momentum. And I really, I've said this before, <clears throat> and I feel like the times that we're in right now, this truly is an inflection point. Mm -hmm. yes. And I believe we have the potential. It, it, and it, and I'm, not, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. No, but it's there. Certainly right. not. It's going to continue to be a struggle. Mm -hmm. But I think we are at that inflection point where we really can begin to shift the Titanic, mm -hmm. change yeah. the direction, right. and put us on a different course. Yes. It will be the most important thing we do. It will be a in huge. our lives. It will be the most important thing. Dynamic shift for all of us, for everyone. Yeah. For this planet to every individual. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then when you trace this back to Cairo, mm -hmm. because remember, this right. whole entire podcast grew out of that question. When my grandson was just born. He was like three months old. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, he's two now. He's three now. He just had a Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Cairo. Yeah, birthday now. <laughs> but the Cairo question, will Cairo have to protest? And I use the pro the word protest because we that question was asked in the midst of protesting around the murder of George Floyd. Will mm -hmm. Cairo have to protest in his lifetime for the birthright to freely and peacefully exist? in the skin in which he was born. So right. he's three now. Mm -hmm. So what's it look like? going to look like when he's like 12, the age that Tamir Rice was when he was right. murdered, mm -hmm. or the age of Trayvon Martin, or the age of uh, Mark Brown, mm -hmm. and then you know the age of Ahmaud Arbery and all of this. So as he's growing, mm -hmm. all of the fruit of the labor that we're laying down now should be reflected in the life that he's living as he's growing, right? And the freedom to experience equity <clears throat> everywhere. Absolutely, and I generosity. believe it's possible. Yeah, it's possible. It ain't yeah. gonna be easy. Mm -mm. But it, it is possible. gonna be easy. But <clears throat> it's nothing to be afraid of to build an equitable society. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's good for everybody. It certainly is. <laughs> it certainly is. So it looks like we are really starting to wind down. And I want to make sure that we have enough time to go through our calls to action because we've got some really good ones. <laughs> yes, got some yes. good ones. So I want to start with my call to action. And this is a challenge for people out there who um, listen to our show, follow our show, and maybe you're trying to figure out where am I going to go next? How am I going to do this? And so one of the um, resources that I have, it's actually 
um, a collaborative book project <clears throat> of which I'm one of the authors that was released back in uh, February. And this book had a really, really strong launch. We hit uh, number one bestseller, in, number one international bestseller in four countries, United States, Canada, um, Australia, and the UK. And we also hit number one in 10 categories, 10 individual wow. categories. Wow. And so the reason I'm bringing that book up is because that book actually reflects equity through writing, right? And so it's a collection of stories, my own included, of 45 women, literally from around the world, who got together to tell their story. And the name of the book is Voices of the 21st Century, Women Transforming the World. And so it's aligned so completely with what this conversation is about. It aligns with embracing equity and it aligns with um, embracing gender equity as well. Okay, so that's my two my two cents. Uh, Voices of the 21st Century, you can go visit my website, theplacetosword.com and find out more information about that particular book. So I'm gonna turn it over to Gail and you wanna talk about yours. So we got like three minutes left. Oh, well, congratulations, <laughs> completely. <laughs> yes. So I, I wanna talk about mindfulness and remember that's the observation without judgment of self or other being curious, um, inquiring within your, ourselves and yourself what is true and what is absolutely true. And my hope is that each of us takes a moment each day to be mindful of what we believe when it comes to racism and where we fall in those three mindsets that we looked at today, fixed growth and benefit. Get in touch with your unknowing, seek understanding and do something different. Watch a movie on anti-racism. Listen to a long talk. Join. Do something that kind of stretches your comfort zone a little bit. Mm -hmm. And my question is, who do you want to be and what kind of world do you want to create? Mm -hmm. Great, great. Cool. My ask, my call today for action is please, please, please watch Who We Are, a documentary by Jeffrey Robinson. If you do anything in this space, watch this film. You will be changed. It is so, um, it is just so helpful, has so much history. It is very factual. It is just awesome. It's on Netflix. Uh, there are also, if you don't have Netflix, there are a number of Jeffrey Robinson interviews on YouTube. So just uh, Google Jeffrey Robinson who we are. I hope you watch it, folks. It is so good. Excellent. Excellent. So um, I, I have the, our closing quote, and this quote is from Susan Harmeling. She's a Forbes con contributor and a business ethics uh, expert. And she's talking kind of within the context of uh, Isabel Wilkerson's book and cast and, and that mm -hmm. whole thing. Um, let's not fall into the trap of thinking that all Black people or all white people or all the members of any identity group are the same. We are not. And I love the fact that she used the words we. We are not. We are diverse in many ways. And class is often ignored as the powerful determinant of discrimination that it really is. In order to be able to see the whole picture, we must expand our everyday equity, diversity, and inclusion scope to fully include social class and caste as factors that are important as the other human traits such as race, gender, sexual orientation that have already entered the public consciousness are currently acknowledged, monitored, and addressed. So what she's saying is we have to look at the full picture, the whole entire. Yes. House, right. Oh, so I think we're pretty much out of time at this point. And so to our audience, I want to just thank mm. you very much for joining us. And we will see you the next time on Inflection Point Podcast. We are here on Transformation Talk Radio every first and third Wednesday of the month at 3 p.m. Pacific time and 6 p.m. Eastern time. So we will see you for the next insightful conversation. 
Thank you for listening to Inflection Point Podcast, where our mantra is cultivating change from the inside out. The journey towards anti-racism and social change doesn't stop here. Truth, reconciliation, and healing come from ongoing, open, honest, and deliberate conversations. Continue to dive in and deconstruct your thoughts, ideas, and beliefs as we band together to manifest social change. Tune in to Inflection Point Podcast every first and third Wednesday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern here on TransformationTalkRadio.com for more conversations about how we can cultivate change from the inside out.